chapter 24. We're going to attempt to go through verses 1 through 15. We'll begin talking about uh, the end of times after the church has been raptured and what is commonly referred to as the tribulation and the great tribulation. Uh, depending upon how you define it, you could say the tribulation is for the first three and a half years and the great tribulation is for the last three and a half years. I'm not going to really get that specific tonight. Uh, it is all tribulation. There is a point when it becomes even worse than the beginning of tribulation. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that at some point. I don't know that we'll make it that far tonight. All right, let's begin with verse 1 and 2, Matthew chapter 24. And what began this chapter is that the disciples had asked uh, Jesus to take a look around at the temple. And uh, some of the commentaries say that, you know, Jesus was somewhat upset and the disciples are trying to cheer him up and trying to get his mind on something else. And so they say, look at the temple. Isn't it awesome? Isn't it great? And all these kinds of things. And we're going to see uh, what Jesus' response is. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. It's interesting that it says he went out and departed. You think that he could just say it one way. But what this is about is that Jesus will never go back in his earthly ministry to the temple again. So that's why it says he went out and he departed. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So, uh, so his disciples came to him. And what we're looking at here is uh, Solomon's temple had been destroyed that was originally built by Zerubbabel and Ezra. Testament. Uh, I've preached before about Zerubbabel and Ezra and the rebuilding of the walls and the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, so, but Herod the Great uh, <laughs> had greatly expanded upon the, that temple and improved it. Herod was known to be a great builder. Uh, he was crazy, but he was a great builder. When I say crazy, he killed family members out of concern for someone taking his uh, kingship. And so he was uh, very evil and very crazy, but known to be a, to be a great builder. Uh, and so we see that. Jesus says, not one stone shall be left here upon another. And about 40 years later, this comes to pass. There was a Jewish revolution against the Romans in Palestine. And uh, at first it went well, but then the Roman soldiers came back and crushed the rebellion. And that happened in A.D. 70. And we all know what A.D. means? After the death. That's actually there is a, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually there is a, a Latin term for that, but it's okay if you just remember it as after the, the death. Uh, so, uh, A.D. 70, the Romans come in and they level the city and the temple, just like Jesus said it would happen. So, uh, the disciples could not imagine this. We talked a little bit, I think, the last time about just the stones that were in this temple. Some of them 50 feet long and 25 feet in depth. So huge. It's hard to even imagine how they you know, put those in place there. Uh, but this prophecy uh, that Jesus gave to them, by the way, I think the AD 70 is in your questions. So uh, this prophecy was fulfilled literally. Right? It's important that we understand that. So Jesus was not talking about a figurative tearing down of the temple uh, or a destruction of a religious system. He was literally prophesying 
that the temple would be destroyed to the point that no stone would be left upon another. That's pretty you know, heavy destruction, right? And uh, the prophecy was fulfilled literally. And it leads us and should lead us to believe that all of the rest of the prophecies contained in this chapter should also be taken for a literal fulfillment. And that's, that's important. When you, when you begin to look at things, this is kind of, uh, you, you're, getting a, you're getting a master's level of teaching uh, when it comes to understanding that because when you have a literal prophetic thing come to pass and it comes to pass literally, then you should take surrounding verses as though they were going to, going to happen literally as well. So uh, important to understand that when it comes to studying the Bible. Verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, this is often called the Olivet Discourse. In other words, he's sitting on the Mount of Olives and he's telling about the future to come. And uh, it tells us the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? There's three questions here. They probably thought they really only asked two questions. But I think it's three. Uh, so when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? And then what will the sign of the end of the age be? That's what I think those literal three questions are. Uh, and the reason why I'm splitting those up is because we know from studying the last part of this chapter that uh, when Jesus comes back from the, for the church in the rapture, it is a different time frame than when he comes back at the end of the age, right? So he'll come and, and, and we'll be gathered up to him in the sky in the rapture, but this, they're also asking about the end of the age, so that is after the great tribulation, and Jesus comes back and he sets up his earthly kingdom here as well. The end of the world instead of the end of the age. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just studied New King James on this one in particular, but uh, it would be interesting. You can, you can uh, probably look that up. So Jesus had told them that the temple is going to be completely destroyed destroyed, uh, and it's just logical that the disciples would want to know when that was going to happen, right? Now, just in general, one thing you will notice about prophecy that relates to the coming of the Lord is that it is somewhat vague at times, and there's purpose in that. Because the Lord wants every generation. You know how many generations there have been since Jesus prophesied this? The, the Lord wants every generation to be ready for his coming at any point, right? Uh, so there is, it's not that the Lord's trying to keep something from us, but uh, there is a purpose in the vagueness of the timing in particular uh, that we see uh, for this. Uh, <clears throat> What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So uh, Jesus will answer these questions, uh, and they're going to be significant. You know, even when things don't come to pass in our generation, it's still important to know the Bible, right? It's still important to know the prophecies. Uh, I will be honest with you, there are not a whole lot of prophecies that are left to fulfill. There are some concerning the end of the age, like we talked about last week, the revelation of the Antichrist. The, uh, uh, tonight we'll talk about the abomination of desolation, which is yet to come. Uh, so uh, there, there are some things that we're to still look for that will come to pass. Uh, verses 4 through 8. This is where Jesus begins to kind of describe the world conditions uh, during the period of the disciples at his ascension and then the time pre uh, proceeding after that. Uh, and 
his second coming. So it says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. How many knows that we need to be doing the same thing? Right? Make sure that nobody is deceiving you. How do you do that? Get in the Word. Right? Study it. Line by line. Precept by precept. Uh, dig it out. Look at as much as you can. Uh, commentaries. Bible studies. Um, original language, if you can dig that deep. I like to do that. Some, some, you don't have to, but, you know, hey, some people like to do that. So take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. How many knows that that has been happening since Jesus and continues to happen, right? There's always someone out there saying, uh, you know, well, we're going to read this, but look here, Jesus is over here. Jesus is here. He's come back here. Uh, so we, we see that that uh, is continuing to happen. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. How many in our day are hearing of wars and rumors of wars? Right? Now, what I we're going to get there. But I'm going to just challenge your mind. None of these are the specific sign of the end of the age. All of them combined are. Right? So you're going to see things like uh, wars and rumors of wars. People saying that they're the Christ. Uh, see that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We see that, right? Continuing to happen. And there will be famines. We've seen famines. And I, I, I remember reading and seeing about famines uh, uh, in the news. It's been happening for ages. Pestilences. Many people describe COVID as a pestilence. Uh, yeah, pestilences. Like, we don't think it's the plague. <coughs> or is it, would that be the frogs? It depends, depends upon what your definition of those things. I, I, it, you could define it as a pestilence or as a plague or whatever. Uh, and earthquakes in various places. Have you seen the rise of earthquakes? Lately, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. If you underline in your Bible, I think the beginning of sorrows would be a great thing to underline because we're going to talk about that. What does that really specifically mean in the original language? Uh, <laughs> take heed that no one deceives you. I was alive in, I was graduating high school in 1984, and there was a book coming out, I think it was 84, might have been 85, it said 84 or 85 reasons why the Lord's coming back this year, do y'all remember that? Might have been 88, I don't know, but there was, and then when it didn't happen, they came out the next year with another one with 80. Nine reasons, or eighty, whatever, so many reasons, one reason more why the Lord is coming back, right? Uh, and what does the, the Bible tell us about the return of the Lord? Jesus. No one, no one knows, knows right? No one, one knows but the Lord. Not the angels, not uh, any of those. So, uh, see that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. All these catastrophes must happen. But singularly, they do not describe the end of time, but combined, they give us a, a big sign. That we're headed, do you see the, the acceleration of these things? That's really what you're looking for. And I, I certainly see that in uh, earthquakes and some of the other things. The acceleration of those. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Beginnings of sorrows. In the literal translation, that means the beginning of labor pains. Wow. That's pretty descriptive, isn't it? The beginning of labor pains. Now, I've never had a baby. 
never burst one. But it's because I physically can, right? Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to even if I could, but because uh, it looks really painful. What do you notice when the birth is about to happen? Increase in intensity. Uh, not only intensity, but time, right? So they come quicker and more intense. So that's what Jesus is really talking about here. He's saying, oh, yeah, you're going to see rumors of wars and wars. You're going to see pestilences. You're going to see earthquakes. You're going to see all these things. But when you begin to see the intensity picking up and the speed picking up, might be an aha moment to be really watching for uh, you know, the end of the age. And so uh, we see that beginning of labor pains. I thought that was pretty interesting and very descriptive. Verses 9 through 14. So Jesus is describing to his disciples what they should expect during the time between his ascension and his second coming. Uh, here in these verses. It says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. <coughs> Do you know that all but one of the disciples were martyred? Right? John, John was the only one that died of, <laughs> I'm going to say, natural causes uh, because he wouldn't die when they tried to boil him in oil. Right? Uh, and when they tried to kill him in so many other ways because uh, he had still had something in God's plan to do. No, no, he was put there by the by the government. Oh, that's right. He yeah. was. Yeah, he was. He was. It was a was. part of his punishment. Yeah, he was. So, and yeah. no one was there. Am I correct? Wasn't it a he there and live in a cave? I, I can't tell you that. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, we, I know that it, it was a very isolated island, barren. Uh, barren. Just describe it as a big rock. Yeah. But uh, I mean, they could have, since they put John there, it's possible that they could have put some other prisoners, but I mean, you know, like his own, yeah, good, good point. Like, kind of like a, an Alcatraz of a sword. So they'll deliver you up to tribulation, they'll kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another. Now, This is talking about Christians betraying one another. Christians who left the faith, left their belief in the Lord, and then they begin to betray other Christians. Right? And then will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Well, there's a message there. Isn't it? Hang on. So your neighbor say, "Hang on, right? Amen. Hold on. Wait. Uh, endure to the end, because the prize goes to the not to the swift, but to the one who endures to the end, right? And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. That's good news." That gives the world an opportunity to know Jesus, to know the saving plan of God, as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So uh, Jesus told the disciples, you should expect to be persecuted. Uh, he's telling them all about that. Uh, the persecution, especially the betrayal, will reveal those who were traitors to the church, uh, as well as as well as traitors within the church, right? Uh, false prophets will arise uh, saying that, you know, when we did uh, First Thessalonians, I think it's First Thessalonians, could have been Second, but one of the questions there was, has the Lord already come? Because they were, 
they were, that's one thing that they were concerned about. They were wanting to know, has the Lord already come? Paul assures them, no, there's certain things that have to come to pass. Uh, so uh, there's going to be false prophets that arrive, uh, <laughs> much deception, lawless, lawlessness will abound, uh, and his disciples should expect to see society become worse and worse. Have you seen that? Society becoming worse and worse? that this is not our home, right? And so even though the world's getting worse and worse, the Bible tells us to look up because our redemption is drawing nigh, right? Uh, it tells us to, that for, for us to hold on, to hang on, to have endurance, to have perseverance, right? Because if you were to just look at this world, how many knows it would be real easy to get upset, concerned, Depressed, discouraged, you know, disenchanted, disenfranchised, all those kinds of things, right? All those lovely D words that, you know, not bad words, but words that start with D, right? Disenchanted, disenfranchised, all those kinds of things. It'd be easy, and we have to still watch ourselves to understand that this world is not our home. How many occasionally, I'm raising my hand, occasionally have lost sight? Oh, this world's not really my home. You know, temporary, for, for a moment. You, you kind of look at what's going on in the world, and you I can't believe this is happening. Overwhelmed at what's going on, but we can also be assured that we're drawing closer and closer to the Lord's coming, right? Uh, so it's important. Now, I love this because we play a part in this. It says, this gospel of the kingdom in all the world as a witness to the nations and then the end will come. We have a part to play in that. As a church, the main central focus of our church is to get the word of God, the gospel message out to the nations, out to our nation, out to our community, out to our region. That is the primary thing, one of the very primary things that we do is about getting the word of God out. It's important. It is vital. And if we do our job, <laughs> maybe we'll help hasten. I know the Lord has a time, so don't come back to me. But maybe we'll help hasten the coming of the Lord, right? And the end of the age. If we'll get out and make his word proliferate and preach the gospel message. How, Pastor, I'm not a I'm not a pastor. I'm not a preacher. How do I preach the gospel? Just exactly the way you live. Right? I know it sounds cliche, but many times we will say things like, you may be the only Bible that people read. So, and there's, there's truth in it, right? Uh, I was amazed to find out, you know, a decade ago that in our community, there are people that never heard Jesus Christ. I was like, what? Are you kidding me? How is that even possible? Right? But there's a great influx of people from other nations here. And uh, not only that, but maybe we haven't even done a great job of getting the message to those who were originally native to this uh, nation. We haven't passed it from one generation to another like Carol's talking about. Right? We have we have kids right now. Well, not right now. They didn't. But, I mean, yeah. a few months ago, we had kids that had not heard. Right. right. I yeah. wouldn't have thought that would be true. Actually, not of America. Not of the never heard of Jesus. It, it, it is true. Well, yeah, I have asked some of your Sunday school teachers. They don't hear it from home. Have, they don't come to church. Yeah. Where are they going to hear it? Yeah. They're, they're not going to hear, hear it if they don't, you know, if you're sure not going to hear it to school. To it. So, are we taking our job seriously? It is a fact. I will tell you, I've seen kids in the city. Last verse. Well, we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> Last verse. Jesus describes the sign of his coming and the end of the age through a sign 
called the abomination of desolation. It's not the only place that you see that terminology. You can go to the book of Daniel and you'll find that terminology. Uh, matter of fact, when you're studying Matthew 24, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, those Thessalonians that talk about the end of the age and the return of Christ and the rapture, it's a great thing to go back to Daniel, and Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 12, pick up on some of those prophetic things that are said about the end of the age, right? You know, preacher, when I hear about the abomination of desolation, I always think of Jezebel. She was so godless and evil, and all that was left to her was what her hands and her head, I mean, she oh. was... <laughs> She might be. Yes, she got eight by dogs. Yes, she did. Let's read verse 15. And we'll, we'll move there towards that. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, we'll talk about what we really believe this to be and some historic things that happened that kind of uh, give us an example of the type of thing that could happen uh, at the end of the age with the abomination of desolation. So, therefore, when you see the abomination of Desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. The holy pl place, and I will tell you this, when you dig into the original language about the holy place, it is the temple. You can look at it figuratively and say, oh, the holy place is inside of me. No, this is talking about the temple. In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Yes. So, uh, whoever reads, let him understand. So, the abomination of desolation speaks of the ultimate desecration of the Jewish temple. There will be an establishment of an idolatrous image in the holy place itself. Uh, and because of that, that is when we will see what is referred to as the great tribulation, the wrath of God, the judgment of God being poured out is the abomination that brings desolation. That's one way to look at that. So, this inside the temple, there will be an idolatrous image. We'll get there, but uh, we have, there's something that happened prior uh, that gives us an idea of uh, the type of thing that would happen. And then I believe when we look into the future, that the Antichrist will be involved this abomination of desolation. So, uh, standing in the holy place. By the way, there are some, and I agree with my commentary and with several others that I read, that think that the abomination of desolation took place in AD 70. Remember when the temple was first destroyed? But too many things stack against that. That is, uh, that did not happen. That was a historic event. That was something that was uh, very important, but it was not the abomination of desolation. So the fulfillment of this prophecy about the abomination of desolation was highly unlikely until the year of 1948. What happened in 1948? Jerusalem became, or Israel became a nation. In a day. Well, we could really talk about some of those things, but we'll try to finish tonight. Um, so, Israel becomes a nation, and the only way that there can be a temple in Jerusalem and the holy place is for Israel to become a nation, right? It has to, it has to be there, it has to be a nation. Uh, and by the way, that prophecy of them coming back together as a nation uh, took about 2,000 years for the fulfillment to come to pass. Wow. That's a long time. Don't ever give up on the word of the Lord coming true. Amen? Uh, so it was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, and that is in Daniel 11.31, if you're taking notes. It 
it says this, they shall defile the sanctuary fortress, then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. So that's referred to in the book of Daniel prior to Jesus talking about what it is uh, in his time on earth. So, and Paul elaborates on this later. We did study this, 2 Thessalonians. It's amazing how some of these things are coming back around to us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4 says this, That day will not come unless the falling away first comes. The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Hear this, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So uh, that's why I'm saying that I believe that the Antichrist will set up an image of himself in the temple, in the holy place, and will uh, declare that it has to be worshipped, right? Uh, that's the abomination that will bring desolation, the wrath, the judgment uh, of God in the final days. Don't he kill himself Second. and come back to life in three days? He, he mocks everything Jesus He does. He, he is a, uh, not only an anti-Christ, but a prototype. He tries to mimic everything that the Lord uh, right. did, a he's, counterfeit. He's a right. squatter. He has right. to squat on everybody, the Lord's yeah. everything, because he's a liar and a thief and there's nothing to him. So... Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, gives us a time frame. Now, I said the rapture, there's not an exact day. No one knows. But once the Antichrist has set up this image and there is the abomination of desolation, the Bible gives us an amount of days. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. Let me read it to you and then we'll talk about it. And from that time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Tell me what's significant about 1,290 days. It three is three and one and a half years. So the abomination of desolation, if we look at the time frame, will happen in the middle of tribulation. And from that point, it will be known as the Great Tribulation. Not great as in, woo, also great as in, oh no, you know, God's, the, the extremes of God's wrath upon sinful man and being, um, uh, not being accepted as, as Christ, right? But, uh, so look at this abomination of desolation use this term, but it's so important. It is actually a critical sign of uh, the judgment of God, the end of the age. It's a warning to flee uh, in Matthew ch chapter 24 for Israel to flee whenever this begins to happen. Uh, we haven't really talked about that, but it is. It's a sign of the consummation of all things. See that in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. And it is a marker for the end of days in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. So it's why we talk so much about the abomination of desolation. And uh, it's important for us to understand that. If you go back, I said some people thought that A.D. 70 was when this abomination of desolation took place. Uh, that's because Rome came in and they conquered Egypt and just I mean, Egypt conquered Israel and uh, destroyed the temple, but they did not, number one, Israel never fleed to the mountains. Number two, uh, they, they did not come in historically, there was, there's all kinds of records of that time frame, did not come in uh, and set up a uh, idol and desecrate the temple. They just simply took it down. Right? So that's important for us to understand that because there's still some people that believe that. Uh, historically speaking, in 
167 BC. I'm going to end with this. So 167 years prior to the age of Christ, there's a figure known as Antiochus Epiphanes. And it's a foreshadowing of what will happen in the Great Tribulation. He came in, uh, he's kind of a prototype of the Antichrist. He came into Israel, uh, I believe it was Syria. I believe it was the Syrians that came in. He came in during that uh, time frame and he desecrated the temple and he offered a sacrifice of a pig on the altar to Zeus. Zeus is that mythological, essentially he's the little g god of all the little g gods, right? Uh, and so that is a foreshadowing of what is believed to happen in the Great Tribulation. Let's go through the questions. I covered that faster than I thought, but who knows how long we'll discuss that. <laughs> Question number one. When was Jesus' prophecy about the temple fulfilled? AD 70. AD 70. Question two. Because Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled literally, what does that indicate about, I should say, the other prophecies in this chapter? They will also be fulfilled literally, right? Uh, question three, according to verse three, what three questions did the disciples ask? The time frame, when will this, these things have to be? Number two, what's going to be the sign of your coming? And then number three, what will be the sign of the end of the age? Okay? What is the literal meaning? Beginning of sorrows. Beginning of labor pains. Correct. According to verse 14, what will happen before the end comes? The gospel will be preached in all the world, to all nations. And then, according to verse 15, what is the specific? I'm calling earthquakes and all those other kinds of things as and disasters and all that kind of thing. I'm calling their signs, but the specific sign of the second coming of the Lord, according to verse 15.